Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with uh, Kim Strassel and uh, Bill McGurn. We're talking about Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and his emerging position on Ukraine and the war on Russia and foreign policy. And Kim Strassel was making, I think, a important point about the ability of Governor DeSantis to maybe distinguish himself from both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and he's missed an opportunity to do that on Ukraine. And I think the way to do that, is just to build on Kim's point, so one of the things that he mentioned in his questionnaire, Ron DeSantis, said, we need peace. Well, what's the fastest way, the best way to get a peace in Ukraine? And it's, I think, he could stake out a position that says, get the arms that Ukraine needs to beat back Putin so that Putin will come to believe that he cannot prevail, that the costs are too great for him. And that's the fastest way, I think, to avoid a broader conflict if we're willing to give them the arms it needs. And in fact, Biden, that gets separates you from Biden because he has been so cautious about that. And it also separates him from the isolationist position of Donald Trump, which says, come home, America. Europe isn't really all that significant and, and in U.S. national interest, and they have to defend themselves. That could be a position that is sustainable, I think, politically, would allow him, DeSantis, to come out as his own man. And it will be interesting to see him take that line, and it would be more consistent with his relatively hawkish politics of his past, Bill. Right. In Congress, you know, he was a pretty strong supporter of traditional conservative policy. You know, the overarching determination of reactions to Russia, it seems, on the left, there's a valid concern it's a nuclear power. So no one wants this expanded to NATO and everything. And I think least of all, Putin himself wants it expanded to NATO. And so you have to be very careful uh, not to inadvertently expand the conflict because Russia is a nuclear power. But I think too often, that becomes a default position. You can't do anything with the nuclear power. And we see that with like North Korea and Iran with its bomb efforts. And that's a really bad precedent that if you get nuclear weapons, you can more or less do anything to upset the world order because people are more afraid of a possible nuclear power. It seems in Ukraine, that we have a nice rebuke to that. You know, the Ukrainians are inflicting incredible damage. They haven't widened the war. In a way, it's the best of all worlds to rebuke Putin. And I think there's a lot we can do. You mentioned long range missiles or planes or something. I mean, Putin does have the advantage that all the fighting is in Ukraine right? So nothing really at home. But if Ukrainians started to attack in Russia as a response, he might think differently. I think Putin himself has very little interest in expanding the war because then he has all NATO against him. And I think he loses and may lose his life. So I think his real hope is to bully and threaten and get what he wants in action by doing that. And I think the traditional Republican response is not what we see in Ukraine. You know, when Reagan ran in 1980, you know, he dispelled the myth that you had to take care of things at home or you can't intervene in the world, be strong because you have home. Like now we see the people saying, oh, you have to either take care of East Palestine or Ukraine. I think that Reagan proved that's a false dichotomy. You can do both. And I think America is hungry for that kind of common sense. And that's the opening I think DeSantis should take. Yeah, you can combine a position of strength and military with prudence abroad, but aiding Ukraine and without any U.S. casualties or troops involved strikes me as an element, as the kind of Reagan doctrine that uh, Ronald Reagan would have supported. And since the outcome in Ukraine is obviously impossible to predict, Ukraine victory, Russian victory, some kind of stalemate that uh, creates a frozen conflict with Russia occupying a big chunk of 
of Ukraine. It could be any of those things, and we don't know what it'll be. So given that fact, and because the politics, therefore, are so contingent on events you can't predict, it's a very good argument for doing the right thing <laughs> and let the chips fall and standing strong for a position that we have described possible separate from Trump, separate from Biden, and go from there. I think it's a sustainable position. Let's get a clip from Mike Pence laying out his position on Ukraine. I strongly support continuing to provide the Ukrainian military uh, the resources necessary to repel that Russian invasion. Um, I, I truly do believe that uh, we are the arsenal of democracy. Uh, we are the leader of the free world and continuing to stand uh, with Ukraine to support their fight there is consistent with the conservative principles first articulated by Ronald Reagan uh, back in uh, uh, back in 1985 he said that the United States would support people fighting for their freedom against communists in their country so that we wouldn't have to fight them here it's called the Reagan doctrine and it, it set into motion forces that literally caused the collapse of the Soviet Union. Kim, strong statement by Mike Pence. Also, Mike Pompeo has come out strongly for supporting Ukraine, as has Nikki Haley. So there's going to be a big debate in the GOP primaries. Yep. We are going to see that as a major point of division. One other reason why, last little bit of criticism here, of the decision that he made to kind of answer this questionnaire as a way of getting his information out out there. And as Bill said, it did seem like a calculated statement. But look, if you're going to be a serious candidate for the Republican nomination, you know, those serious people, they go and they give a speech and they lay out all the contours, the well thought out foreign policy agenda. And I would prefer to have seen him do that. Now, maybe he still will. Maybe he felt compelled to have to have some answer here. And like I said, I think he's given himself some running room still to potentially do the right thing, as you say. But, you know, that kind of statement from Mike Pence, that in itself was so much more fulsome as to the rationale and the reasons guiding him. I'd really like to see something more like that from Ron DeSantis. Where does this really come from? How does it fit into his wider vision of the world? Felt a little piecemeal and calculated so far. Yeah, I think that's just a very powerful point, Kim. But it's always hard for a governor to establish his foreign policy bona fides in any case, Bill. So if you're going to do that, you need to do it in a forum and in a way that allows you the room for some nuance, the room to put your position on Ukraine in a larger geopolitical context so people can see how you think and what you think. And basically sounding off in clipped form in response to a questionnaire from a Fox News host is a rookie mistake, I think. It shows that there's a more of a preoccupation with kind of playing easy politics with a prominent voice in the Republican primary races instead of sticking out of your own position and forcing everybody else to respond to it. Yeah, I think that's right. Also, it didn't work, right? He's going to have to give a foolish speech, like you said, to explain because he left so many questions open by his statement. He's going to have to clarify what he really means. Is he really in Donald Trump camp on Ukraine? Or is he somewhat open to more of a traditional view like uh, Mike Pence? So I think he's going to have to clarify. And the worst thing will be if he tries to clarify but ends up trying to play both sides, he will not look principled. And that, I think, will be the biggest thing that hurts him if he looks that way. That hasn't been his problem so far. So far, he's attracted attention because he's taken stands, made fights, won a lot of them, and gone on. But if he starts looking opportunist and hedging and not being clear about what he really means, I think he's done. I think the best thing for him is to, with his advisors, to admit this was a mistake and move past it. You know, he doesn't have to apologize, but he should issue a good statement or give a good speech on what he thinks American interests are and move past this, because I think it's an albatross. Interesting, Bill. Yeah, and he's not entering the race at least until May, maybe later June. So he has time to formulate this, time to think 
it through, and we'll see how well he adjusts. You know, the primary season is long. Inevitably, a lot of missteps by candidates, and some of them can be fatal, but there are others that you can recover from, especially at this early stage. So we're going to see how this develops. Thank you, Kim Strassel. Thank you, Bill McGurn. Thank you all for listening. We're here every day on Potomac Watch, and we'll be here tomorrow again. So thanks for listening, and we hope to catch you tomorrow on Potomac Watch. Thank you.